Hi, good morning Geography Classroom and welcome to week six. Now, before we start going through today's session, um, I want to just do a little roundup on last week on Earth Day 2020. Now, I was absolutely overwhelmed by the number of photographs that I got sent, by those of you that did your face paints of your favourite animals that you found out about in Borneo. It was incredible. So thank you so much to everyone that got involved. Now, it was really difficult to decide who was going to win the adopted animal. And as a result, I decided not to choose myself. And I got two of my friends to have a look through all your photographs and all your research and to decide the winner. And they both picked the same person. Now, this person, she, did some research on the clouded leopard that lives in Borneo. And the cool fact that she found out, and I'm just going to check my notes, was that the scientific name for the clouded leopard is actually called nebulosa, which is the Latin word for cloud. So, Holly Nash, age, age 10, living in Bournemouth, you have got an orangutan that has been adopted in your name and is winging its way through uh, to you in the post right now. And we've made it a yearly adoption. So basically I'm gonna pay a little subscription every month so that the World Wide Fund for Nature can protect the rainforest in Borneo. So give yourself a massive round of applause. Well done to everyone else that took part. I'm gonna put a photograph up now, which is all of the work that you sent me. Um, so just have a look and see if you can find your own picture. Thank you again for taking part, it was amazing. Okay, so welcome back. Uh, let's go through the list of things that we're going to need for today's session and then we are going to do the quiz. So, first things first, you will need your plain piece of paper, okay? You are definitely going to need your colouring pencils. The brighter, the better today and you'll see why in just a second. You're going to need a normal pencil and then I would love it if you could find a pen as well. So go and get the bits that you need, make sure you're all set up for today's session and we will make a start. Okay, so got your piece of paper, take your pen, write the numbers one to eight like we do each week, okay? So you've got the numbers one, two, eight. Okay, so I've got some tricky questions today, so you're gonna need to listen super carefully. If you want to repeat a question, just pause it, go back, rewind it and listen to it again. Right, question number one. What is happening to the Earth's climate? Is it getting hotter or is it getting colder? Okay, question number two. What were the two things that humans were doing that caused climate change? So what two things were humans doing that caused climate change? Okay, question three. Which continent is Borneo found on? Which continent is Borneo found on? And for a bonus question, for those of you that want to really, really challenge your memory, which three countries make up the island of Borneo? That's just a bonus question though. Okay, question number four. Last week, we looked at cutting down trees. There was a special name for that process, cutting down trees. What was that special name? Okay, question number five. What are the two factors that make up climate? So whenever I talk about climate, I talk about two things. What are the two factors that make up the climate? Okay, question number six. What's the name given for a species that makes its own food using sunlight and rainfall. So essentially what is at the bottom of every single food chain? Okay, question number seven. What is the name of this continent? This one here. And question number eight. What is the name of the line that separates the northern half of the world from the southern? Okay, I'm going to put the board up just for a second, so if you need to pause it, you can. So what was the Earth's climate? What's happening to it? What are the two causes of climate change? Which continent is Borneo found on? What is the special name for cutting down trees? 
which two factors make up climate, what is the name that we give a species that can make its own food using sunlight and water, and then last but not least, what is the name of this continent, and what's the name of this line that separates the northern part of the world from the southern? Okay, write down your answers, we'll be back okay. in a sec. So, you've done the quiz. It was a little bit tricky this week. They are getting progressively harder. So if you're finding them harder, that is okay. Right, question number one was, what is happening to the Earth's climate? So I expect everybody is saying right now, it is getting hotter. Okay, question number two was, what are the two things that human beings are doing that is contributing to climate change? So one of the things we're doing, we drive cars. And cars have got petrol in, and petrol is a fossil fuel. Now, when we burn that, that petrol, it creates carbon dioxide, which enters our atmosphere. So one of the things that human beings do, you could have said drive cars or you could have said burn fossil fuels. The second thing that we do as humans is we cut down trees. Now, remember, last week we looked at the fact that trees take in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And actually, when we cut down the trees, they're not able to do that anymore. So we've got two answers to that question. It could have been driving cars, cutting down trees. Okay, question number three was, what continent is Borneo found on? So Borneo is found in Asia, okay? Question number four, what is the posh name or the geographer's name for cutting down trees? Now, this is a long word and it is hard to say. So everyone say this after me, deforestation. So say it, de forestation. It means cutting down the trees. If you use that word, it makes you sound like a proper, proper geographer. And in today's lesson, I'm going to teach you three words that are going to make you sound so smart, it is untrue. But if you can remember deforestation, that is also going to make you sound like a really good geographer. Okay, question five was, what are the two things that make up climate? So when we talk about a country's climate or an area's climate, we're talking about how much rainfall it has, and what temperature it is. Okay, question six was, um, what do we call something at the bottom of an ecosystem that uses sunlight and water to grow so it can create its own food? So the name for that is a producer. You might have written grass or you might have written plants. That's fine, but the technical proper name is producer. Right, question number seven. What is the name of this continent? And this probably gives you a clue as to where we're going today. So this is South America. And then this line, and the reason that I've asked you this question again, is because the place that we're studying today actually sits along this line. In fact, it has a little bit above it and a little bit below it. So that is the equator. Right, give yourself a mark out of eight, and then... Let's crack on with today's lesson. Okay, guys, so I have to say I can barely control my excitement about today's session because today's session, we are going to look at one of the most incredible places on the surface of the earth. And I'm going to tell you all of the reasons why um, in just a second. So today we're going to be studying a place called the Galapagos. Now, the Galapagos is a set of islands that belong to the country Ecuador, which is in South America. Now I'm gonna show you a map in a second so that you'll be able to see where Ecuador is in South America, but then also where the Galapagos are in relation to it. So the Galapagos is a set of islands that are 536 miles off the coast of Ecuador in the Pacific Ocean. And these islands are incredible. The reason being is because there are so many species that live there that don't live anywhere else in the world. Now that's going to be our first magic word of today's session and the word we're going to use is endemic. Now this is the most grown up word, the grown up geography word I can teach you. Basically people don't normally learn about the word endemic until they're at least 16, sometimes 18. So say this after me endemic. Okay, say it again, endemic. Now, if a species is endemic, it means that they only live in that place. So we're going to have a look at some species that live in the Galapagos Islands that don't live anywhere else in the world and are unique 
They can do some really cool stuff that we're going to have a look into. Right, I'm going to put both the maps up now. So the first map that you're going to see is of Ecuador, the country. And you'll notice that it's on the west coast of South America. Might be worth getting your atlas out and having a look for it to see where you see if you can see it and where it is in the, in the whole of that continent. And then the second map that you're going to see is actually the islands of the Galapagos themselves. Now you'll see from that map that there's the equator running through the middle and then some of the islands are above the equator and some of them are below the equator. But they are honestly the most special set of islands in the world. Right, have a look at your maps. Okay, so now you've had a good look at where they are. And as I say, take some time with your atlas if you want to really, really figure this out. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about these islands. So these islands are where a very, very famous scientist called Charles Darwin discovered something called evolution. Now, he discovered that essentially animals are adapted to the environment that they live in. So when we looked at our penguin in Antarctica, we had a look at the fact that the penguin had blubber and the blubber helped to keep them warm in those cold temperatures. We looked at the fact that they had waterproof feathers so they could go in the sea and not get cold. We looked at the little pooch that they had on the front that they were able to keep their baby penguins in. Now they're all adaptations to the climate. And it was on um, the Galapagos that Charles Darwin discovered that all animals begin to adapt to the environment and the climate that they live in. Now, what I want you to do is to watch the video that is in the playlist that is the introduction to Galapagos. So it's about four minutes long and it just shows you how incredible, how beautiful these islands are. They were actually created by underwater volcanoes that have come up under the sea and then erupted onto the surface, which is unbelievably cool. So watch that video now, the introduction to Galapagos, and we'll be back in a second. Okay, so the video is amazing, right? You will have seen on that video all or not even all, some of the different animals that live on Galapagos. So they've got the blue-footed boobies, they've got the giant land tortoises, they've got the only tropical penguin in the world. So most of the, well, all other penguins live in areas that are cold, except there is one type of penguin that lives in the Galapagos. And most importantly, because this animal is going to feature heavily in today's session, you have just seen the marine iguana. Now, the marine iguana, I am fascinated by them. They are the only reptile in the world that swims. And today's session, we're going to have a look at marine iguanas and how they, uh, essentially how they use plants to survive, the animals that then are predators for them, but also an animal that they have a really unlikely relationship with that helps to keep them safe and that they help to keep safe. So the first thing that we're going to do today is I want you to take your piece of paper and we're going to draw that kind of volcanic landscape that you saw. So we're going to start near the top of our page and then draw a line that sort of comes down and across. And don't worry because I'll show you in just a second what it is that I'm drawing. So it needs to look a little bit like that. OK, now that represents... That, as I say, that rock, rocky outcrop and that land that those iguanas live on. Now, the next thing I want you to get is a blue pencil because we're going to draw in the sea and it's going to come about halfway up our rocky area. OK, so it looks like that. Now, the next thing that I want us to do is this. On the seabed, so underneath the sea where the rocks are, I want us to draw some big rocks, okay? Because these are actually really important in our story today. So, we're going to draw some big rocks that sit under the sea. Now, the reason that we've drawn those rocks is because on top of those rocks, there is something called algae. Now, algae is a funny word, okay? Now, for some of you, you might actually have seen algae before because if any of you have got a fish tank at home 
and that fish tank sometimes gets the green stuff that grows up the side of it and you see the fish eating it. That is algae. Now, the rocks in the Galapagos under the sea, they are covered in red and green algae. And that algae is what our marine iguanas like to eat. So I'm going to get a red pen and then I'm going to get a green pen. And on the rocks underneath the sea, I'm going to draw my algae. So I'm going to draw it so that it looks a little bit like grass tufts on top of my rock. So take your time. Always, if you need to pause the video to catch up with something, please, please do, all right? We don't, you don't need to rush at all. Right. So let me just show you what I've done so you can start yours. So I've drawn some of the green algae on those rocks. And now I'm going to add in some of the red algae. Now this red algae is also quite unusual and it isn't really found anywhere else in the world other than on the Galapagos Islands. And it is really important because... This algae is actually a type of producer. It's essentially an underwater plant. So this algae uses water and sunlight to produce its own energy, which is what causes it to grow. So we're going to take our pencil and we're going to add a label. We're going to put algae, which is a word I do not enjoy trying to spell because it's quite hard. So look at it carefully when I hold it up. And then next to it, we're going to write the word producer okay so there we go so we've got our land and then our rocks that are under the sea and they're covered in this red and green algae which is a producer because it is created or sorry it creates its own energy through sunlight and through water okay so we've now got our land we've got our rocks that are under the water under the ocean that are covered in the red and green algae that are our producers but now we're going to have a look at the animal that eats them. So this is the marine iguana. Now the word marine means sea. So whenever you hear the word marine, we're always talking about something that either lives or is near the sea or works on the sea, etc. Now a marine iguana is completely unique and that's why we would call it an endemic species to the Galapagos. It only lives in the Galapagos Islands. Now, these marine iguanas, they can go underwater and hold their breath for up to an hour. There is no other reptile in the world that A, goes in the salt water, B, that can hold its breath for an hour. Now, the reason that they do that is they actually dive down to eat the algae that is growing on the rocks under the water. So there is nothing better to a marine iguana than a snack of algae uh, for, then that's what they eat. That's their herbivores. They only eat plants. Now, there are some other really cool facts about marine iguanas. So the first one is that when they dive down under the water, often they get salt water stuck in their sinuses. Now, I know some of you will have been swimming before and it's that horrible feeling, isn't it, when you get water all up in here around your nose and it's all here. Now, what the marine iguana does is it squirts that salt water out of its nose which is so cool. And I'm gonna show you a picture right now of the marine iguana squirting salt water out of his nose. Now you will notice then that I showed you two other photographs of marine iguanas. One of the marine iguana eating algae off the bottom of those rocks. And the second photograph I showed you was one of the, them sitting on the land to show you just what incredible colours a marine iguana is. And that's what we're going to have a go at drawing now. So I'm going to put that marine iguana picture back up on the screen. And what I want you to do is to pause the video and then to draw your own marine iguana. And I'd like you to draw it here on the land. 
because once those marine iguanas have been down under the water for an hour, they start to get cold because they've got cold blood. So what they do is they come back out onto the rock and they sit there and they sunbathe. And then that helps them to warm up again. And that's what makes them those beautiful colours. So pause the video now and draw your marine iguana. Okay, so we've all been drawing our marine iguanas together. Here is my one. You can see that he's got lots of different colours involved in him and I've drawn him quite big as well, but I think uh, I like them, so they're bigger. Now, let's add our labels. So as I say, this is called a marine iguana. And what was it the word marine meant? Good, it means to be near the sea, iguana. And our marine iguana, if you remember from when we did our session on Botswana, is what we call a consumer because they eat the algae. Now, he's actually a primary consumer because essentially our marine iguana is a vegetarian. So primary means first and it means the first thing, the first consumer to eat the algae. Now, what we're going to do, like we did last time, is we're going to draw an arrow to show the direction that the energy moves in. So the energy moves out of the algae and into our marine iguana when he eats it. So I've drawn a big arrow to show that that is the direction that the energy is moving in, okay? So as you can see, we've got our producer and then our primary consumer, the marine iguana, and this arrow then demonstrates the direction that the energy is moving in. Now, normally what we would do is go straight on to looking at the predator that would eat the marine iguana. And we are going to do that at the end because there is another incredible video that you have to watch. But what we're going to look at first is another species that actually, I suppose you would say, is best friends with the marine iguana because that animal helps to warn the marine iguana if there is any danger because it makes this really loud, shrill noise. Now, the animal I'm talking about is actually called a mockingbird. And I'm going to show you a picture right now of that mockingbird. OK, so you've had a look at the mockingbird. Really small, aren't they? But as I say, they are best friends with the marine iguana. And they have what's called a symbiotic relationship. Now, that's another complicated word. So we've had three really difficult words today. Endemic, evolution, and now symbiotic. We're going to write all these on our sheet at the end of the session today so you can practice them. Now, symbiotic means essentially best friends or working in partnership. Because I told you that the mockingbirds, they make a really loud noise when they see danger. So when they see something that might attack the marine iguana and that warns them that they need to run away to safety. But the marine iguana is really useful for the mockingbird because the marine iguana has little insects and little bugs that live on its skin and they let the mockingbirds eat those insects off their backs. So the marine iguana provides a meal for the birds with all the bugs and creepy crawlies that live on it. So we're now going to draw our mockingbird. I'll put the picture back up. You can pause the video. Hovering in the sky okay. above our... So again, another one of my amazing drawings. I said that very sarcastically. This is the mockingbird flying in the sky. And it's also a consumer because it can't make its own food. So it's not a producer but it's actually what we call a secondary consumer because it is eating something that the primary consumer provides for it. So we're gonna draw another arrow that shows that energy passes from our marine iguana up to our mockingbird. Now remember, the mockingbird isn't eating the marine iguana, it's actually eating the bacteria and the bugs that live on the marine iguana's skin. So I've just drawn some of those on now so that I remember that it's not actually the marine iguana that the birds are eating, it's the bacteria and the bugs on their skin. 
So the word that I used to describe the relationship between those two was symbiotic. So we're going to add the three words that I've told you that are the hardest words to the top corner of our page. So the first one is evolution. And remember, that means to adapt to the climate you live in. The second one is endemic. It means only found in that one place. So our marine iguana is endemic to the Galapagos Islands. And then the last word was symbiotic. Now, honestly, these words, I wouldn't even normally teach them to kids who are like 15, 16. These are for people that are 17, 18 years old doing geography at A level. But they have a symbiotic relationship. Remember, the mockingbird makes a noise to warn the iguana if it's in danger. But then the iguana provides food for the mockingbird through the form of the bugs on its skin. Now, that brings us to the last part of today's session. What I want you to do is to watch this video because a little while ago there was a film crew out in the Galapagos filming some of these incredible species and they saw something that had never ever been recorded before. They didn't think that anything would be brave enough to try and attack the marine iguanas because they've got those great big spikes along their back. So they thought that they were safe. And then one of the photographers or the film crew saw that there were a group of snakes that were trying to attack the marine iguana. So the last thing that I'm gonna ask you to do today is to watch the video that is in the bio and it's all about the snakes attacking the iguana. And then I will see you next week in the geography classroom. Hope you have the best week. See you soon.